This is a call for all church leaders in Zimbabwe to renounce their false doctrines and false practices. When the ancient Israelites used pagan practices to worship the true God they eventually came under judgment and were expelled from their land. If God judged his people long ago for their false practices should he not also judge those in the church today for the same sin? From the early 1990s many Zimbabwean churches opened their doors to a flood of deception. The leaders who are responsible for allowing this have not repented. What we have now is a mixture of truth and error. Among the church leaders we have some wolves in sheep's clothing who are living comfortably by exploiting the flock. We have other church leaders who are blind guides and don't know they are preaching false teachings. We have other church leaders who know the error but do not want to speak up. And we have very few Christian leaders who will actually dare to challenge the false teachings. Here are some of the many false teachings or phrases you will hear in these churches. Paradigm shift. End times army. Greatest generation ever. Latter day saints. Third wave movement. Such a time as this. Vineyard movement. Word of faith. Kingdom now theology. Dominion theology. Kingdom of God advancing. Marching on the land. New Apostolic Reformation. Manifest Sons of God. Latter Rain. Great Outpouring. Moving in the Spirit. New Apostles and Prophets. Seven Mountains Mandate. Purpose Driven Life. Alpha Course. Promise Keepers. Joel's Army. Gathering. Seeker Driven Church. Unity. Stadium Worship. Vision Casting. Experiencing God. Transformation. Spirit of Elijah. March for Jesus. Speaking into the heavenlies. Making war in the heavenlies. Prayer walks and marches. Binding and loosing. Fire tunnels. Toronto blessing. Anointings. Catch the fire. Touch not my anointed. God's generals. Church growth movement. Sozo. Cursed a blessing. Prayer of Jabez. Holy laughter. Drunk on a new wine. Gold dust. Glory clouds. Gold teeth. Feathers. And more. So how did all this false teaching make its way into the Zimbabwean churches? During the 1900s a number of different movements began to take place on the fringes of Christianity in America. The mainstream Christian leaders rejected the false teachings which were being promoted by these groups and so protected their flocks during those early years. However, these false ideas and trends went underground for a while and over time began to resurface within some mainline churches. With some repackaging, these false teachings were able to pass as biblical, and a whole flood of deception started to work its way into the American churches. Leaders were saying God was restoring what had been lost by the church during the dark ages of Roman Catholic rule. The idea was that Martin Luther had restored justification by faith and that God was now restoring signs and wonders and gifts of the Spirit as well as apostles and prophets to the church. These new ideas and teachings eventually spread to the rest of the world. They were calling for a paradigm shift in the way Christianity thinks and operates. Today, false doctrine has become the norm, and true Christianity is considered by the majority to be old dead church. The new false Christianity constantly attacks true Christianity for being religious, and not in step with what God is doing. The new Christianity teaches that there is great revival taking place and that this is the greatest generation of the church ever, which will rise up and subdue the earth. They claim to be Joel's army who are marching on the land. They quote scriptures like, The kingdom of God is advancing and righteous men take it by force. 
they are into the false teachings of binding and loosing, and spiritual warfare which they get from misapplying the word of God. They are big on having experiences and manifestations as well as signs and wonders which include gold dust, glory clouds and falling feathers. They are big, on healings and miracles. Uniting all the churches together is a major theme for them, quoting John 17. They like to organize huge stadium meetings to worship in big crowds thinking God will bless them because of their numbers. In these gatherings they unite with Catholics, saying the Reformation is over and the Catholic Church and the Christian Church must come together to promote Jesus. They are big on giving prophecies for individuals as well as nations. They have different types of anointings which they like to impart with the laying on of hands, for example they have a Deborah anointing, or a Breaker anointing. They have dreams and visions and give words of knowledge. They say, I just sense that the Lord wants me to say to you, and follow on with some picture or vision from their own mind. Doctrine is downplayed in favor of moving in the spirit. They say, turn off your mind and jump into the river of what God is doing. Don't try to put God in a box. They are big on leadership seminars and training the next generation of overcomers. They want people to submit to their leadership. They do what they call, vision casting, whereby the pastor will come up with a vision for the church, and everyone in the congregation must get behind the pastor and support the pastor's vision. They are working to get Christians into various positions of influence in society and so they promote models like the Seven Mountain Mandate. They travel all over the world having gatherings and conferences and promoting the next big move or new church program that everyone should be a part of. They often say, judge not. Their leaders do not like any criticism. They claim to be God's anointed. They don't like to be challenged about their teachings. They say, touch not the Lord's anointed, do my prophets no harm. Those who speak up for truth against their practices are called divisive. They will say, you have a Jezebel spirit, or, you have a critical spirit. They use their positions to crush any opposers and with heavy shepherding they keep members in submission. Those who do not fall in line are soon expelled and shunned. Many of Africa's churches are being corrupted by this new false Christianity with its faith healers, false prophets and money preachers. These leaders exploit the poor with counterfeit miracles, lying signs and wonders, while promising them health and wealth if they will give to their ministries. Long worship sessions at the start of the services help to set the atmosphere where the congregations are filled with strong emotions of love and happiness to the point where they will accept anything from the preacher. In this video we will examine some of what has been taking place within this new Christianity and learn about the real spirit which is at work. I have no debt. I live in a 25-room mansion. I have my own $6 million yacht. I have my own private jet, and I have my own helicopter. And I have seven luxury automobiles, so I never get bored having to drive the same car more than once in a given week. We believe we received that money, and we went from that place of prayer thanking God for it. We spoke to the angels of God, and we charged them to go and cause the money to come to us. And we thank God for our deliverance. We thank God that we were out of debt. You need to make a vow of faith of a thousand dollars. Oh, Bob, couldn't you say 25? No! If you need some money, I wouldn't change that dial. I look at you and I see money. Did you know that if you want to feed 5,000 people under normal circumstances, you don't need a multiplication of the fishes and the loaves? What you need is money. I've heard a lot of people criticize a lot of the American preachers, but I'll tell you what. Some of those American preachers give more in one month to foreign missions than all of the preachers in this country put together in five years. Giving to God is a part of our worship. 
and we should worship God with our gifts. You steal my offering for this ministry and you'll die. I'm telling you right now, you're touching God's money. Don't you touch one of the mothers. Your hand will fall off and your tongue will stick to the roof of your mouth. And you'll wonder as a beggar for the rest of your life. It's God's money. In the book of Acts, chapter 5, two people dropped dead in an offering. My question is, Jesus never asked for money. Why do you? Well, Jesus didn't have a TV program. A thousand dollar vow of faith, big deal. We got people on welfare that's got enough faith to make a thousand dollar vow and paying it. You wonderful people of God, quit attacking man of God by name. Somebody's attacking me because of something I'm teaching. Let me tell you something, brother. You watch it. You're God in heaven. I wish I can just... Oof. They call out the ministry in my foot. You know, I've looked for one verse in the Bible. I just can't seem to find it. One verse that said, if you don't like him, kill him. I really wish I could find it. <laughs> but don't mention people's names on your radio program and your TV program, thinking you're doing God's service. You're not. You stink, frankly. That's the way I think about it. Sometimes I wish God would give me a Holy Ghost machine gun, I'll blow your head off. I place a curse on every man and every woman that will stretch his hand against this anointing. I curse that man. Who dares to speak a word against this ministry? Here's what I've learned. You, you cast vision for your mission, and if people don't sign up, you move on. You move on. There are people that are going to die in the wilderness, and there are people that are going to take the hill. That's just how it is. Um, too many guys waste too much time trying to move stiff-necked, stubborn, obstinate people. Um, I am all about blessed subtraction. There, there is a pile of dead bodies behind the Mars Hill bus. <laughs> and by God's grace, it'll be a mountain by the time we're done. Um, you either get on the bus or you get run over by the bus. Those are the options. But the bus ain't going to stop. And uh, I'm, just a, I'm just a guy who is like, look, we love you, but this is what we're doing. There's a few kind of people. There's people who get in the way of the bus, they got to get run over. There are people who want to take turns driving the bus, they got to get thrown off because <laughs> they want to go somewhere else. There are people who will uh, be on the bus, leaders and helpers and servants, they're awesome. There's also just sometimes nice people who sit on the bus and shut up. Um, they're not helping or hurting, just let them ride along. Um, you know what I'm saying? But don't look at the nice people that are just going to sit on the bus and shut their mouth and think, I need you to lead the mission. They're never going to. At the very most, you'll give them a job to do and they'll serve somewhere and help out in a minimal way. If someone can sit in a place that hasn't been on mission for a really long time, they are by definition not a leader, and so they're never going to lead uh, you need to gather a whole new core. I'll, I'll tell you guys what, too. You don't do this just from your church planting or replanting. I'm doing it right now. I'm doing it right now. We just took certain guys and rearranged the seats on the bus. Yesterday, we fired two elders for the first time in the history of Mars Hill last night. They're off the bus, under the bus. Um, they were off mission, so now they're unemployed. I mean, you. this will be the defining issue as to whether or not you succeed or fail. Matthew 24 from verse 48. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, My master is staying away a long time. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. One of the many movements within this false Christianity is the new apostolic reformation. When you hear about explosive growth in South Africa, this is the movement. When you hear about everybody in South America, has been saved like six times. 
This is the movement. 369 million people are influenced or a part of a non-denominational movement. That's the best you can call it because there's no HQ, there's no president, nobody gets elected, there isn't a pope. Instead, this is just kind of a loosey-goosey association that has wonky theology as its theme. This movement people call the New Apostolic Reformation Movement, that there are new apostles who are being raised up to lead a forerunner generation, the Joel generation, so that if they will conquer the seven mountains of dominion, Jesus will return and then they get to rule with Jesus. And this thing is growing like a nobody's business. When I did the presentation, I shared some of the major themes and some of the things that we have seen in this particular movement. And I want to kind of move through these very quickly because this is merely to set the table for the consideration that I would like for you and me to have. After we watch what this movement is about, and you're ultimately, I think, going to conclude, whoa, this thing is seriously wacky. You need to know that the kids are entering into it by the millions, and that includes conservative kids. And you and I would be wise as a serpent to figure out why. What do they find so attractive about this mind-numbingly repetitious music that goes on for days? Number 15, tortured teaching. To give you an example, I showed a clip of one of the great theologians of this particular movement telling everybody why the stock market and economy in Japan is not doing well and why there are so few Christians. Are you ready? It's because the emperor regularly is intimate with the sun goddess. Not kidding. Uh, number 14 from this movement, downplaying theology. It's all about being led by the Spirit, no teaching. Number 13, efforts to take over the world to usher in the return of Jesus. Number 12, radically unfulfilled prophecies. One of their leaders says that 80% of the prophetic utterances by this movement are not accurate. They're never fulfilled. This movement should be grateful that we're not living in Old Testament times because they'd have to duck from all the stones that would be thrown at them for falsely prophesying. Uh, more to this movement, romantic songs about the Savior. Uh, number 10, getting snugly hugs from Jesus. Number 9, regular visits to heaven and returning to tell all about him. Blowing shofar horns to wake up angels. Number 7, fire tunnels that said kids and everybody else on fire. Uh, by the way, when the kids walk through these fire tunnels and they shake and they twitch, it looks an awful lot like they might have, I don't know, a kundalini-like spirit. More marks of this movement, the presence of God in the form of gold glitter. Number five, angel feathers falling from the church ventilation system. Not kidding. Number four, werewolf anointings. You'll have to Google that one for yourself. Number three from this movement, lots and lots of dead raising. But interestingly, all of the people who claim to raise people from the dead, they just never seem to have a cell phone available to actually film it. A number two, a mark of this movement, grave soaking to get the anointing of the dead person. And finally, you're going to have to read this one for yourself because I can't. But this was a pastor in a church describing that. All right, now let's pick up with our next point. Dominion theology. What is dominion theology? Well, I just talked about it briefly a while ago. It's this idea that we are to bring God's kingdom here on earth. Now, there are many within uh, evangelicalism today that buy into this kingdom theology, our kingdom now. Uh, many within the uh, word of faith, the New Apostolic Reformation buy into this, but not all of those that buy into dominion theology are part of the New Apostolic Reformation or of the word of faith. In fact, there are many that uh, buy into this 
that would reject the heresy of the New Apostolic Reformation or Word of Faith. But indeed, Dominion Theology is what brings a lot of these groups together, where they would disagree theologically, but they would come together on the idea that we need to take dominion of the culture, of the nations, establish God's kingdom on earth, and then He will uh, come here on earth. He will reign and rule. In fact, let me show you a video clip. This is of a guy named Wyatt speaking at the uh, church of Prophet, if you will. That's what, he, what people think he is. He's not. He's a false prophet, if anything. Prophet Rick Joyner. Wyatt is speaking at the church of Rick Joyner, Morningstar uh, Ministries. Listen to Wyatt describing Dominion theology. When Jesus comes back, he is not going, the head from heaven is not going to come back and rest upon a body that looks like a, it has the maturity of a babe. He is not going to come back and rest upon a body that has the maturity of a teenager. It says that we all will grow up into him who is the head. He will we'll grow up into such a maturity that the father will look down from heaven and say, there is a mature, overcoming bride operating in the earth that is operating at the same level of authority, love, power, character that my son operated in when he walked the earth. Okay, by the way, let me just stop right there. What he's talking about right now, overcoming bride, Joel's army, Omega children, whatever they want to call it. We've discussed that in other programs. This church that they talk about where Jesus will come in his church before he comes for his church. And then this overcoming bride or Joel's army or manifested sons of God will be able to do the very things Jesus did when he walked on earth. Raise the dead, judge the church, judge the world, be sinless, multiply food. That's what he's talking about. Then once this Jesus, this secret coming of Jesus happens. Jesus comes in his church before he comes for his church. Once this secret indwelling of Jesus comes, we are then able to do these supernatural things. We're able to take dominion, they will teach. Then, he's explaining, God will finally turn to Jesus and say, I really should have physically go. Remember the idea is Jesus will come in his church before he comes for his church. And they believe back in the 1980s, the New Apostolic Reformation, known as the Kansas City Prophet Movement back then. Remember, it started in the 1930s as the Latter-day Rain Movement. The 1980s, it became known as the Kansas City Prophets Movement. Then in about 1993, I'm now finding a new video clip recently of uh, C. Peter Wagner admitting that he started giving it that name, New Apostolic Reformation, in about 1993. They were teaching, though, back in the 1980s that the young people then, or the adults then, that their children would be the generation that would be empowered. So they were saying to adults of uh, young kids uh, back in the 1980s, they were saying to those adults, your kids will be that generation that becomes this special overcoming bride, and that generation will help us take dominion uh, and bring the kingdom of God on earth. Let's finish this clip. And at that time, the Father will say, you can be released. And the head, Jesus, will come down and connect with a fully mature body in the earth. And we will work with Jesus to rule and reign in the millennium. The devil doesn't like this message. He doesn't like this kind of thing. He doesn't like you to be activated. We are to rule, reign, govern, expand, advance, and establish the government of God on the earth. Since the Garden of Eden, the struggle has been, who is going to rule the earth? You are in a war. You, you do understand that this is about world domination. All right, let me explain what he's teaching here. They teach, the New Apostolic Reformation and these folks that believe this, teach that once man sinned, they lost dominion. And now it's our job, or the job of Christians, to get back dominion of the earth for God from Satan. Here's the problem, though. Just because Adam was given stewardship does not mean he was given legal authority over all the earth. So they're confusing stewardship with legal authority. But they believe that because Adam and Eve sinned, they then lost dominion. Now we must battle Satan and we must bind Satan and we must take these territories or the seven mountain mandate and take back uh, government, law, education, entertainments, arts. And then once we take these uh, seven mountains, of, of cultural influence, then we'll be able to establish God's kingdom on earth. That's, again, not in the scriptures. Let's continue with this clip. That doesn't mean that we're not supposed to have people within the church infiltrating the top levels of these, you've heard of the, the mountains, the, the seven mountains of the influencers of culture. And God is in this, has us in this place of preparatory dominion, getting us into places of influence, because when Jesus comes back and sets his foot down, Every government will be overthrown. 
All right, here is another guy with the New Apostolic Reformation that many of the new religious right are hanging out with, Lou Engle. Again, he is on staff at the International House of Prayer with Mike Bickle. Uh, this is a group, again, that I believe is a theological cult. But here is uh, Lou Engle. By the way, Lou Engle's also met with and been a part of meetings with Newt Gingrich. But here's Lou Engle talking about the Seven Mountain Mandate. Watch this video. Now, you've seen this, probably seen this, reclaiming the Seven Mountains of Influence. There are seven mountains of influence, could be more, could be less, but the political realm, the business realm, the family realm, arts and entertainment, religion, media, and education. Every one of those mountains is a place of influence. The way you get influence in those mountains is to get the ones that have the ideologies, your ideologies, to the top of those mountains. All right, that's Lou Engle. Now let me show you just a little video clip of James Dobson and Shirley Dobson with Lou Engle at, uh, I think this is his The Call in San Diego a few years ago. I think The Call was in San Diego in 2008. Again, why am I showing this? I'm not showing this to be unkind to James and, James and Shirley Dobson. I'm showing this to show you that many of these people that I believe are a theological cult, that are into dominion theology, many of these other things we've been talking about, are being embraced by mainstream evangelicalism. Watch this clip. And the way to do that is through prayer. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for caring. Thank you for your love for the Lord, for uh, sending your petitions heavenward. And we're here to join our voices with yours today. My friends, many of you have been preparing for the battle here in California. All right, well, there you go. There's uh, James and Shirley Dobson again at The Call with Lou Engle. That's Lou Engle's event, The Call. He holds them all over the country. And again, I have a real problem with uh, evangelical leaders working in spiritual enterprises with people like Lou Engle, particularly when we know what Lou Engle believes in regards to the New Apostolic Reformation and Dominion theology. And by the way, it has not gone unnoticed by the secular media that uh, modern-day evangelicals are hanging out with these kind of people and their Dominion theology. And in fact, uh, some have referred to those that are pushing this dominion theology that desire to take the seven mountain mandate, take the arena of government and arts and entertainment. Um, some of the media referring to them as the Christian Taliban, if you will, which is a very interesting comment because uh, you could see where this would be very concerning to some folks in the secular media when you have people like Lou Engle and the New Religious Right and the Word of Faith and the New Apostolic Reformation, uh, many of them who want to go back to Old Testament law uh, take, wanting to take over the power centers, have a theocracy, if you will. Now, they would deny that's what they want, but in essence, that's really what they do want. Many of them, not all of them, but many of them wanting to go back to Old Testament law. So, uh, dominion theology is completely unbiblical. Take your Bibles, go over to Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. Daniel chapter 2, verse 44 says, And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom. Who will set it up? God will. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to another people. So, my friends, God will bring his kingdom. We're not the ones who are going to bring it here on earth. Come on up, Stace. I was in the room. When the Holy Spirit first fell on David Roos like that, God began to talk to us about a move of the Spirit that would come. But when we were in our 20s, he said that the greatest move that we would ever see would come upon the children behind us, the generation behind us. And 20 years after I had that prophetic word for John and Carol about Jesus throwing back his head and laughing, 
because Satan was falling like lightning from heaven. And that the great danger of that day would be to focus on the manifestations and forget that people's names were being written in the Lamb's Book of Life. 20 years, almost to the week, I had another sign. My son broke his neck. The doctor said, 95% chance he would never walk again. But suddenly, the toes on his left foot began to wiggle. Then the whole foot began to move. Then the other one. And now he can run. Five weeks later, he walked out of that hospital. Never used a wheelchair or a walker or anything since. Driving a car now. And the Lord said, that's the next generation. And people say, can any good thing come out of there? Look at those countries. They're falling. They're bankrupt. They're immobilized. They're quadriplegics, as it were. Can any good thing come out of there? But I tell you, the greatest move of God, the Lord told me when I was 27, would not be our generation but would be the generation behind us, that they would do signs, they would do wonders, they would change nations, they would change, I tell you, they will change society, and society will not change them. And there is a movement. Oh, of reformation coming. And the power of God is going to hit the low places. Justice movements are going to spring up all over the world and make the low places high. Righteousness is going to move into corrupt governments. Brazil, Brazil, get ready. Brazil, Brazil, a wave of my holiness and a wave of my power. Reformation power is coming to the nation of Brazil many other nations too because the low places will be made high the high places will be made low for that generation who prepares the way for the coming of the Lord about three and a half years ago I was uh, praying and pondering. These guys came into my living room, these YWAMers. They said, there's coming a shift to the call. And it will not just be fasting and prayer, but it'll be the proclamation of the gospel, signs and wonders, and stadiums will be filled, and Billy Graham's mantle is coming on this nation. It shook me to the core. With this working in my spirit, I felt I have to connect with Bill Johnson. We had a chance meeting in London. Our hearts were knit together, and he said, Lou, we'll throw the Bethel movement into this thing. It seems like there's a stirring of an invasion of LA for an outpouring of the Azusa Street beyond on revival. We're actually having two weeks of tents all through Los Angeles for signs and wonders prior to this and preceding it. We're really excited about the School of Supernatural Ministry coming into the Colazusa. The teams will be scattered 
through the whole uh, audience in that stadium with thousands, praying for the sick as uh, the Bethel team is actually leading from the stage. We're believing signs and wonders and miracles will be breaking out all over and believing it will be an outbreak of God's glory. I think it's a day that will touch the Lord. And if we'd move together, it could actually bring a shift in unity in the body of Christ. I believe it could be a shift into a a greater day of the healing revivals and a great awakening in America. It'll be a great day. Ah, let's stir it up and expect revival. Important video to show you. And I wanted to just preface it with an information that will help you to understand what the Catholic priest is saying uh, as he prays during this Azusa Now quote-unquote revival. He's basically saying that when the hearts of the fathers are turned toward the sons and the sons are turned toward the fathers, he's talking about the Protestants being turned back to the Catholic Church. He said that's when revival is going to take place. He also alludes and and references uh, Elijah and Elisha. And when that anointing fell upon Elisha, that that uh, that they had to be submitted to the uh, to Elijah, which they say is the Catholic Church. So what you're seeing is a this very same thing that happened to the Charismatics, the Pope reached out to the Charismatics. The Charismatics basically kissed the feet of the Vatican again. And basically, that's what we're seeing happen amongst the Charismatics, uh, Pentecostals, and the Word Faith uh, teachers. Here's the video. Heavenly Father, you taught us through St. Paul in his first letter to the Corinthians that the I cannot say to the hand, I do not need you, nor can the head say to the foot, I do not need you. But the truth is, we all need each other. And Lord, we know that you want to bring revival in our world and in our nation. But we will not have revival until we have reconciliation. And as Elijah prepared Elisha and Israel for revival, first they had to be reconciled. To turn the hearts of the fathers to the sons and the hearts of the sons to the fathers. And so, Heavenly Father, it is my prayer going forward from this historic day, we can all forgive each other. We have to forgive each other. And if we become united, our witness will be powerful in the world. We need to unite. And so, The Holy Father, Pope Francis, has made a covenant, a covenant for Christian unity. So as his representative here in the local church, I make a covenant with Lou Engel and all of you here that going forward from this day, we must fly united. The day she believed that Todd White was the most significant man coming to this gathering. Not It's not about him, but it was what he was going to release of a mantle of evangelism that would come on a whole generation. Here's the deal. 
I believe that the Catholic Church and the Christian Church that we're going to come together right now. As Lou Engel taught us, we need to fly united. The only way we can heal a divided nation, a divided world, is with a united church. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Zimbabwean churches also hold stadium worship events promoting unity. When I first heard about stadium worship, I really thought this is exactly what this nation needed. My heart resonated with this vision because I believe the time has come for the church to come together. This is an event that's about Jesus and it's about the body of Christ coming together in unity around prayer and worship of Jesus Christ. Within New Zimbabwe, in the hearts of men and women, it's the kingdom of God advancing. Zimbabwe has become a haven for false prophets and false prophecy. Hello? Yes, my Lord. Is this heaven? Yes, my Lord. Is it heaven? Yes, my Lord. I have a woman here. Yes, my Lord. What do you have to say about her? Should you ask her who is Sibo? Sibo. Who is Sibo? Oh. 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 Okay. All right. All right. All right. Okay. What else, Papa God? What else, Papa God? God is telling me to ask you why is it He's showing me a heart? would come on them that they may be healed. Now you're going to, I want you to watch something. Now, good enough. Can you, can you see this shadow here? Can you see it? Can you see it? Thank you, Lord. You can see it? You can see it. Thank you, Lord. Of the anointing of the Lord, hear my shilla yada, yaba yaba la. Did you see that? Did you see it? stand up. Can you imagine that? They still can't get up for the surge of power that went through them. For the surge of power that went through them. They still can't get up. They still can't get up. Five men to one couldn't pick them up. Pastors, are you ready? You want something? Take it! That's yours tonight. You want it? You want it? Take it! You want it tonight? Take it! 
the power of the Holy Ghost. Take it. Oh, take it. Take it. Take it. By the power of the Holy Ghost. Cindy Jacobs tells nations what they want to hear. And I am getting ready to pour out a miracle anointing upon the Philippines such as the earth has never seen. For Indonesia, they had a rushing mighty wind, but in the Philippines, they will have the fire from heaven that will begin to fall. This will be a purging fire, and I will say I will visit even as in the days of God. Do not think that I am not able to come in a day and begin to unravel the iniquities of the nations, says the Lord. I am going to visit the military. I am getting ready to come among the young military. And the Lord says there's going to be a revolution of righteousness that comes within the military. I'm getting ready to dethrone everything that needs to be dethroned, where even the balls of heaven are full. Oh, See, the balls in heaven are just getting ready to be tipped over the Philippines. Matthew 7 from verse 22. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Cindy Jacobs is one of many false prophets who have given false prophecies for Zimbabwe. Her false prophecies can be found online. She is a leader in the new apostolic reformation which is spreading its false teachings throughout the world. Many of Zimbabwe's churches are corrupted by these false teachings and practices of the New Apostolic Reformation. New Frontiers Church supports these false prophecies for Zimbabwe. According to a post on Scott Mark's Facebook page, church leaders had the joy of being led by the president of the Evangelical Fellowship of Zimbabwe, Dr. Shingi Munyeza at the National AGM, in what felt like extraordinarily sincere repentance by the church. We turned away from all trust in man, all trust in money, all idolatry, all hatred, all corruption, all greed, all bitterness, and all sin which has had devastating sway in the church, let alone the nation as a whole. We cried out to God that he would work out his purposes with us, and then through us to the nation. I was greatly inspired by this genuine humility and faith. Scott continues, Two of my favorite sentences from Cindy Jacobs' prophecy for Zimbabwe from many years ago, over which I often reflect are. 1. Their river is going to flow through Zimbabwe and I see a powerful torrent of water, a mighty rushing torrent, many fish. And. 2. This army will be used to stop war and bloodshed. I, Nigel Ring, have recently been reminded of a prophecy brought by Ginny Bergen, a respected prophet in the New Frontiers family of churches, in June 2002 at the annual New Frontiers Leaders Conference in Brighton. Simon Pettit, who was bringing apostolic oversight to the New Frontiers churches in Zimbabwe at that time, invited the Zimbabweans onto the platform during the prayer meeting. P.J. Smythe gave a report on Zimbabwe and the dire state of the political and economic situation there. However he also gave a positive report on what God was doing in the church in the midst of hardship. Another leader, Mbanizai, thanked the New Frontiers family for its support. Then another came and gave a number of prayer points for Zimbabwe and the churches there. This was followed by prayer during which Ginny Bergen brought this prophetic word. I saw the word Zimbabwe in a big thick cloud of black smoke and I felt as if God wanted me to say that the stench has arisen to his nostrils, the abomination of the sin and pride of man. And just as Abel's blood cried out from the ground so it is as though a piercing cry from the very ground of that nation rings in my ears. And I hear the cry.
I hear the cry and you have such a great high priest in whom and through whom righteousness and peace have kissed together and from whom flows forth justice like many waters and this night I write righteousness, peace, and justice over that land. Righteousness, peace, and justice let it be written over that land. And I am writing on the hearts of the evangelists the word Zimbabwe. And many from many nations will go and that place will not be dry and barren and ransacked and desolate but that place will know the free fall of many waters, that place will know many many rivers, that whole continent will open up for I have written my word by the power of my spirit over it. And I tell you, liberty will come to that nation in the space of one day. One day. How should we respond to current events in the light of these prophetic words? Do we just thank God and wait? I don't see that in scripture, we seem to be called to pray the fulfillment of prophecy into being. Referring to the prophecy in Jeremiah 25 12 foretelling the people of their deliverance from the Babylonian captivity we read in Daniel 9 2 and 3. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that, according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet, must pass before the end of the desolations of Jerusalem, namely, seventy years. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. What did Daniel do? Did he sit back and say that fulfillment was inevitable? No. He prayed. I believe that now is the time for us to stand with our brothers and sisters in Zimbabwe by taking hold of these prophecies concerning Zimbabwe and praying them into being. Will you join me and thousands of others around the world to see this evil regime removed and for the nation to be restored? Let us join them in praying for kings and all those in authority that we may lead peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. See how they try to pray their prophecies into existence as if they were actually the word of God. Cindy Jacobs can be found on many online false teacher lists. Some Zimbabwean pastors can be found on those same lists. To understand how false teachings and practices entered their Zimbabwean churches we must go back to the year 1994. In 1994, church leaders and members from many countries began traveling over to Toronto, Canada to receive an anointing which they called the Toronto Blessing. This anointing was then taken home and passed on to others within their local congregations around the world. This anointing was combined with the Alpha Course from Holy Trinity Brompton London with Nicky Gumbel. This Alpha course was spread around the world and adopted by many churches in Zimbabwe. You can research online to find out more about how the Alpha course is ecumenical and has a weak gospel. Yeah. What, what do you think she'll be speaking on? Well, the theme of the conference is unity. Mm. So we've got uh, the Cardinal, um, Vincent Nichols, who's head of the Catholic Church in the UK, and the Archbishop of Canterbury together. We've got, um, uh, we've got Joyce Meyer, and uh, Father Raniero Cantalamessi, who's the preacher to the mm. papal household. Um, again, they're, they're slightly different traditions. <laughs> yes, I was going to say. I mean, if you want to talk, do a conference on unity, what a great sort of yeah. display of, of yeah. people you can bring together on the well, same that's, stage. Well, that's very much the vision. And, yeah. and, and unity across nations as well. There'll probably yeah. be over 100 different countries represented there. There's 1,600 people coming from around the world. Yeah. Um, there are so far over 50 archbishops and bishops booked in to the conference. So it's, it's, it's um, unity across the world yeah. and unity across the different parts of the church. Let's take a look at this Toronto blessing anointing. It is important to take note of what was being said by those spreading this anointing. They claimed this was the next big move of God. They claimed God was doing a new thing. They told people not to question what they were seeing but to jump into the river. If you criticized the practices they would say you are blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Doctrine became a bad word. If you spoke against this movement they would call you, divisive or say you had a religious spirit. They told people not to, quench the Holy Spirit. They told people not to put God in a box. They claimed this was a great end times revival. 
We are now in 2018, so let's take a look at the fruit of this anointing and examine where it really came from. In 1994, an unusual revival began in a small church near the end of a runway at Toronto's Pearson International Airport, and it would soon draw the attention of people around the world. The revival became known as the Toronto Blessing, and today the church, now called Catch the Fire, is a growing family of churches worldwide with various missions programs as well as a training college with international campuses. And the amazing journey has been chronicled in a new book, From Here to the Nations. The 20th anniversary of the start of the revival is coming up very soon, January 20th. So we've invited John and Carol Arnott, the couple who've been giving leadership all these years, to give us a look back and a look forward for the ministry of Catch the Fire. Welcome. Thank great you. To have you guys it's with great us. to be yeah, here. Great to be here, Ron, really. So we were ready to swing back more into the power of the Holy Spirit. And we went to a Benny Hinn meeting in 92. Yeah. God, God wanted to let me. I'm a little drunk right now. Please forgive, forgive me. What are you laughing about, dear brother? Who? Oh. 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 And uh, that was in Toronto, and Carol got absolutely blasted, didn't you? Absolutely, <laughs> just filled to overflowing. Yeah. I was so overcome by the Holy Spirit, so empowered. I was just like I was electrified for all that day, all that night, and all the next day. And I, I had to carry her home, basically. <laughs> he did. But I'm saying, baby, <laughs> stay under it, because we so want this. We, we, we just want this. Yeah. So oh. all these things were, were setting the stage they were. for January 20th, 1994. Right. Just yeah. kind of describe what happened from there. Well, we had heard uh, very soon after Argentina that something similar had happened to Randy Clark. Our, we, we knew him casually. He was a, a pastor in, from St. Louis that was in our network, and we knew him, and invited him to come. Mm -hmm. And he came sort of in trepidation as well, uh, because none of us knew, like, if anything going to come of us, we don't know, but let's just get together and see what yeah. God does. And that's when it all just oh, it was exploded, amazing. really. Randy Cheers. just called us up to, anybody wants prayer at the end of the service? Come up. He said, I don't know whether anything's going to happen. Oh my gosh. Wow. We now know what it means when the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. fell, because he fell on the whole place. Right. So your, your small church there at the end of the runway, it was part of the Vineyard Fellowship at yeah. the time. Mm -hmm. uh, all of a sudden this happens and then, and then day after day, it, it continues to it happen. Did. And then just describe kind of, kind of the next you know, few days, weeks and, and months after that. Yes, we, we just had to keep going. I'm, yeah. I'm, I said to Randy, listen, you're not going <laughs> home, okay? So we'll have to figure out what to do with your church and a snap, but we, we wouldn't let him go. And he stayed with us for the better part of six weeks. He did. Went home a couple of times. But yeah. meanwhile, we got into the whole thing of nightly meetings. Mm -hmm. And um, we didn't know how you could sustain and have protracted meetings in, a, in today's world. But mm. people started coming from all over the place. They came by the plane loads from England and many from the U.S. and all over the, our country. And it was just an, an amazing phenomenon that gained more and more and more. We were scrambling to find a bigger location and finally found our current one, which was uh, 10 months later, we moved right. in yeah. mm -hmm. to now where we could have thousands and thousands. So Catch the Fire became kind of a good name to uh, rename <laughs> yourself yes, it to. Was. It was. And uh, all, all over the world. So, so bring us right, right up to date, like what, 
What's happening now and into the future for the ministry of Catch the Fire? Well, we have a network of churches all over the world, Partners in Harvest, that's really grown out of all of this. Plus, we have many friends uh, in what we call a Revival Alliance, which is a friendship of six ministries, of which we're one. Mm -hmm. But uh, Bethel and Bill and Benny Johnson and, and um, Randy Clark and Cheon and Heidi, Roland Baker, these people have more or less grown out of the Toronto movement and they're championing this move of the Holy Spirit all over the world powerfully. And they're only, we're only six of hundreds wow. that have been mm -hmm. touched by the Holy Spirit. And so mm -hmm. it is going and we're excited how this is really being passed to the next generation. Yes. You know, we have a school of ministry oh. that is amazing, but so do all the others. Right. And they're releasing this into young people. And yeah. I think the greatest thing for us is just to uh, see the change and transformation that's right. happening right. in our own youth and our own young people and as they pick up the baton right. and go the next 20 years. And they're on our shoulders going higher. They're incredibly anointed. They're incredibly gifted. Yeah, they, they love are. Jesus. It's so wonderful yeah. to see it continuing I like know. that. And this the next is generation carrying thing. it on. In 1994, the Toronto Blessing Anointing was passed to many churches in Zimbabwe. Those who passed it on failed to research the actual sources and so opened their churches up to the greatest flood of deception ever. One of the strangest experiences I had a few years ago visiting Amy's tomb in California. This Thursday, I'm on TBN. Friday, I'm going to go and visit Catherine Kuhlman's tomb. It's close by Amy's in Forest Lawn Cemetery. I've been there once already, and every so often I like to go and pay my respects because this great woman of God has touched my life. And the grave uh, where she's buried is closed. They built walls around it. You can't get in without a key, and I'm one of the very few people who can get in. But I'll never forget when I saw Amy's tomb. It's a incredibly dramatic. She was such a lady that her tomb has seven foot angels bowing on each side of the, the, her tomb with a gold chain around it. As, as incredible as it is that someone would die with angels bowing on each side of her grave, I felt a terrific anointing when I was there. I actually, I, I Hear this, I trembled when I visited Amy's tomb. I was shaking all over, God's park came all over me. The man with me and I were shaking. Norm, who worked with, with Miss Gwyn for years, took me there. And Norm and I were trembling under the power of God. I said, dear God, I said, I feel the anointing. I began to weep. On the day of Pentecost, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. The hour is at hand, my friend, when there will be times, even as a moment such as this, when there will be such oneness in the Spirit, when the Holy Ghost will come upon those in the assembly. Those who know absolutely nothing about the Holy Spirit and great waves of glory will come upon them and every person present will be filled with the Holy Spirit and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I believe that. God wanted to let me. I'm a little drunk right now. Please forgive me. Uh, what are you laughing about, dear brother? Ooh. Ooh. You know what? If your engine is not revving up, you know what you need? You need a Holy Ghost enema right up your rear end. It's going to go, and I prophesy. I prophesy under the anointing 
people look at you if you jerk or shake like something's wrong with you. Well, I want you to know the time is coming. If you don't shake and jerk, it's because you're not in that river. You're not in the river of what God's doing. Wake up, church. 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 It's time. It's time to rise, oh bride. Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. Oh church, arise, arise in the name of Jesus. In the name who passed on this anointing to who? Benny Hinn visits the tombs of Catherine Cullman and Amy Semple McPherson for this anointing. John Arnott received this anointing from Benny Hinn. Randy Clark received his anointing from Rodney Howard Brown. He claims to be able to heal people with just the touch of his hand. He is the Reverend Randy Clark, and they come by the thousands to see him. But are his so-called powers faith or fake? Our Martin Hamill tonight, with the one person the preacher just can't seem to heal, himself. The show is about to begin. They have come to Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania to be healed by a preacher. Now, in Jesus' name, all pain in this stomach, listen to me. This is not a safe place for you. But the star of this show is running late because strangely, here he is laying on the floor in his office. He's the Reverend Randy Clark and they are praying over him. This unintelligible utterance is called speaking in tongues, believed to be God channeling through them. We increase that anointing. It is a preamble to the big healing extravaganza. We bless her in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We bless her in Jesus' name. We bless that woman there at the blue. Somebody get behind her, quick. It starts off with Clark's so-called army of healers who call out their word of knowledge. They claim to feel the pain and sickness of those in the audience. Someone feels like they have like a speck in their right eye. Father, right now, do it. Pain in Jesus' name. Now. We definitely, as he was praying, I could feel something happening in my eye. My husband held my hand um, in the car earlier today and I was like, oh, don't do that, that hurts. And now it's like, I can't even make it hurt. Randy Clark is a self-proclaimed faith healer. He set up the Toronto Airport Church. His followers, many thousands of them, flew into Toronto to be healed. And Reverend Clark has become a star, especially in the third world. This man claims to be paralyzed on his right side. Randy prays for him. Voila, he's supposedly healed. At another gathering, this woman says she was born deaf. After prayer, another so-called miracle. She seems to be able to hear. The name of Jesus. Why is it in the third world you see so many more miracles than you do in the first world? They understand the realm of the spirit more. They believe in healing. They, have, they uh, through shamans and witch doctors and stuff, they know that there is a connection between the spirit world and this world. And so their worldview is very open to the supernatural, where our worldview is very, very limited to the supernatural. I just think it's the same old garbage that we've heard for many, 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 many years. Eric McMillan from Skeptics Canada says it's all an act. We ask you to unzipper heaven and pour out your Holy Spirit. All they want is a theater at the moment. These people who talk about the cures they've made, they don't actually do the follow-up to find out what happens to those people afterwards. They don't care. They just want the, they just want the performance on stage and for the money to come in. Some doctors say belief in a healing God is no different than belief in a fake pill. It's called the placebo effect. That's the conclusion from a study by Dr. David Orbach at Toronto's General Hospital. Often things like uh, back pain, fatigue, depression, um, those types of symptoms can sometimes improve substantially if there's a belief on the part of an individual that a, a certain treatment is likely to, to help them. But wait a minute, the kicker in this story is that this faith healer is practically crippled himself. Randy has degenerated discs in his back that have made it almost impossible to move. So why hasn't he healed himself? 
it is a little embarrassing or a little humiliating to be doing a healing conference on the first night on crutches. <laughs> but at the same time, it's part of what we've believed that it's not about us at all. It's all about him. Don't think it's impossible. Don't think it. Nothing can happen. Believe. Believe. And faith healing doesn't seem to be helping him. Why aren't you healed and others are healed? I believe I will be healed or I believe I will get better uh, through therapy or worst case scenario, I may have to have surgery. Uh, I'm going to do what I need to do to be able to do what God called me to do. And he's not alone. Richard Yeager can't seem to be cured either. Yet he's here, still hoping. You know, I always think like, well, what am I doing wrong? Why aren't I healed yet? Because we always felt like we were going to be healed and get through this, you know. And now our kids are grown and, and they've missed a father that was, you know, could do things with them and things like that. The climax of this whole seminar occurs when Randy gives impartation. It's the process of imparting what he calls the gift of healing to others. In Jesus' name, let anointing for healing come upon him. Stir up gifts in him. In Jesus' name, increase, increase, increase. I bless you in Jesus' name. But we bless them, Lord. We bless them in Jesus' name. Bless her, Lord. In Jesus' name. Randy turns to Richard Yeager. Father, we bless Richard in the name of Jesus. Lord, we can do nothing by ourselves. So we ask God for Richard. You pray and nothing happened. And that whole, one man, one of my whole message is talking about uh, story after story after story of people I prayed for and they didn't get healed. It's very sad. In Jesus' name, In Jesus' name. If I don't get healed supernaturally, I'm still gonna believe in healing uh, because I've seen too much of it not to believe. And I have to live then with the mystery of well, why am I in pain? Ask yourself if this anointing is from the Holy Spirit or a deception. I don't know why that is, but stand on one knee step. When you get up here, there'll be a message from the Lord on your heart, and I want you to deliver it to the become no, 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 on these steps. Now, no, that ain't enough. Good. Yeah, right, that's good right there. Praise the Lord. Rise up this day and be filled afresh with the new wine of the Holy Ghost. Rise up this day and oh, sepala manama erepe eribo ahaha. Oh, koridi Oh, refied ahaha. Oh, repasianama. To drink, 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 to drink. O Sikaya, we drink parombo, mendebre viviva, ambrosto cora della brevibia. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. We're not worried what other people think. No, uh -huh. doesn't matter what they think. Oh, no bore di esta pagaliado. Oh, le beve di abbasso dopre. In a man, man, no bo go long bon jema. My name on bo rivia casti. I tell us also. Ooh, prefer yes. Yeah, I'm going to walk up on the day. She's going to be a I'm going to go to my head. 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 I'm Father sees what you see. Yes, the angels are seeing what you are seeing. Oh, oh, it is good. Look, look, says the Lord. Look, 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 look into the round. Oh, ha, 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 ha. Oh, you are moving into the round. Ha, hoka, hila, hora, yawakoka, ya, ha, aurikate, bri, ha, ha, la, he. You are moving higher into the spirit realm. You are being lifted like you are being lifted into the realm of the dynamics of the revelation knowledge of God. See, yes, hear, hear the word of the Lord. Hear it, hear the voice of the word of the Lord. Yes, hear the voice of the word of the Lord in the spirit. It is talking to you now. Oh, El mamon gay stal flap kulikikim finstam bonskosta baba baba. There's a realm of the supernatural, God says, stir it up. 
Stir it up. You've walked in it. You've seen it. Oh, but it's going to come in a greater dimension and in a greater way. For many, because of excesses of fear, to step over. And they've actually pulled themselves back. But you are not. Because you know the real and you know the genuine. And so you'll step over and run. Run! Run! Run with the move of God. Run with the move of God. Run! And I must support all revive. And I must... Oh, your churches are going to fill up. I'm going to sweep the streets. I'm going to fill your churches. I'm going to fill your churches. I'm going to fill your churches. Say the Lord. That's what I'm preparing you for. That's why I sent you here. And that's why I'm pouring the rain. Melamina, Melamina, Mona, Mona, Malamina, Nina, Malanina, 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 Melanina, Malamina, Melanina, Melanina. Times of refreshing. T -t times, times. Taya, 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 taya. Times, taya, 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 taya. Times, taya, taya. Maka, happy, 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 happy. Mengine, mengine, nini, nini, na, nunu, morini, aha. Heaven's melody. La 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 and I give you this opportunity to come and to move this morning. Let the fire of the Holy Ghost fall now in Jesus' name. All over the building right now. All over the building right now. All over the building right now. Up in the balcony, all over the building, are loose. The very fire and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. In the name of Jesus. That's it, you're not true. Let the fire, let the fire, the fire of the Holy Ghost, the fire of the Holy Ghost. Take it, take it, take it. Let it go right through you. Fire filled, filled with the glory of God right now, right now, right now. Filled with the glory of God right now. These are not drunken. It's. You cannot make this up. These people are under the, under the presence of God. What's happening to you, sister?
Station of that annoying. We got there. Yep. We got there. As long, my sister, I know you've been reading the Bible, but as long as we say it's laid up, the wicked going to keep it. But God says time for us to tell that money, you don't belong to the wicked. You belong to us. And I want you to get in the right place. Money.
Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Let me have that chair. First Corinthians chapter 10 verse 7. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. What churches do you know in Zimbabwe that promote and sell books by Kenneth Hagin, Kenneth Copeland, and other money preachers? Now compare these manifestations with New Age and Pagan practices. It would be useful to let go of your suppositions that this is the way the reality game is played. He was able to go right to where there were issues, that I've had long-standing physical issues. And all of a sudden there's this freedom of laughter and fun and just exhilaration and it's just blending and it's... I felt these emotional tears come to my eyes. It's not about unconfusing you. It's about infusing you with something that feels confusing but is just naturally right. When you're confused, you actually start to learn stuff. There are miracles that happen every day. In fact, they happen in between the blinks of our eyes, but we miss them because we're only paying attention to what we normally pay attention to. If you're not used to sitting at a table and having it melt, or having the floor turn into goo, then that's probably not going to happen for you unless you're sitting there with me. Then it's almost guaranteed. I believe we all have abilities that we haven't unfolded because we never consider the possibility of what would happen if we did. You're accessing a grid of information, a possibility, this quantum field, and there is a science of consciousness and energy to it. You can enter into a reality where the floor is melting and not melting. <laughs> a part of you knows that it's not really melting, and another part of you goes, shut up, I'm having fun. <laughs> right? There we go, that's nice. You go with that. 
you're not learning a set of rules, you're actually learning to apply something on the fly. I'm sorry, but you all share a delusional state called matter, which it doesn't exist. It's a delusion, it's a persistently held, well-developed delusional consciousness. The new physics tells us that matter is no more than a state of information. That's Oppenheimer saying that. Excuse me, you know. Start thinking about your chair, your toe, your shoe as that. Informational field activity. The quantum physicists say that all is consciousness and there is no matter whatsoever. This is not mind over matter, this is mind as matter. What it's about is just accessing another part of the spectrum of consciousness. You know how you do that? You stop not accessing that spectrum of consciousness. It's really simple. Most of you may not be aware of the pressure of your feet in your shoes and the way your shoes imprint on the carpet. Until I mention it. How many people now are suddenly aware of the pressure of their shoes? Yes, exactly. What we do is we delete information because it's not useful. Hear this? We delete it. This is a survival mechanism so that we don't go crazy. As long as you're stuck in a relationship with a condition, it's always there. In other words, I don't want to treat your heart condition, right? Because then what am I doing? Well, I'm teaching you how to be a smarter heart condition. <laughs> and you move their condition where it's literally they can't experience it. It's not there, right? And they'll go looking for it because it's like they miss it. There we are. Oh, wow. <laughs> All I did was enter into a state of causation. The state of causation doesn't mean you actually do something. It's like if you throw a pebble in a pond, right? You cannot control the way the ripples play out. You program your intent by deciding what it is you would like, but then you have to let go of it. Once you let go, that's where the ripples occur. This is why you drop down. Drop down means you enter an altered state where other realities are just as real and possible for you in the moment. You place intent, you pick up the pebble, you decide which one, you look at it, you decide you like the texture, the feel, the taste, and then you let go. When you let go, you are done. There is nothing to do. There's nothing to be. The ripple takes care of itself. Drop down, place intent, and let go. It's the let go that's the most important part. That's where things happen. Richard, can we do this on ourselves? Oh yeah, yeah, I don't recommend it when you're driving. <laughs> Here's you, Just go out here. There you go. Now, watch yourself change. That's it. <laughs> what people need to be able to do is access their own magic within themselves, that, that thing that makes them special, and then they just release that into the world. And that is the power of the universe right there. I really believe that anybody can learn matrix energetics. We've found some things that work consistently and can be taught that opens a process of discovery. That's when things open up and then you start to tell me Wow, I did this, and I'll go, really?
वो आपका क्यों नहीं तो वो मुझे पकड़ लिया आप फैसला करके जाओ Deuteronomy 18 reading from verse 9. Occult Practices. When you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to imitate the detestable ways of the nations there. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices their son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft, or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord, because of these same detestable practices the Lord your God will drive out those nations before you. You must be blameless before the Lord your God. The Prophet. The nations you will dispossess listen to those who practice sorcery or divination. But as for you, the Lord your God has not permitted you to do so. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. For this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God nor see this great fire any more, or we will die. The Lord said to me, What they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. But a prophet who presumes to speak in my name anything I have not commanded, or a prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, is to be put to death. You may say to yourselves, how can we know when a message has not been spoken by the Lord? If what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is a message the Lord has not spoken. That prophet has spoken presumptuously, so do not be alarmed. Maharishi Mahesh Yogi uh, basically evangelized the West, uh, came over here, won a veritable tours and lectured with the Beach Boys, was promoted by uh, the Beatles, and led masses of young people into transcendental meditation. A lot of these people that were practicing it began to have horrifying experiences, demonic attacks, things of that nature, and uh, this is documented. And it was able to slither into the to the schools, the public schools to a degree. And then books came out on how this is a very religious practice. And, and Maharishi Mesh Yogi, his own admissions from his own books were that these mantras they were uttering as they were meditating were the names of Hindu gods. Well, the Bible says that these, the gods of these nations are demons again. So, uh, people were invoking spirits and under the banner of what was, you know, billed to be something scientific. And Maharishi Mahesh Yogi says, and through transcendental meditation, you're not just calling out on one spirit, you're calling out to the head of all these different spirits. You can get all the power from them at once, uh, which we would understand as the prince of demons or Satan, you know. Uh, with tantric yoga, you're talking about yoga, which is sexually perverted and mixes spirituality, kind of like Aleister Crowley's sex magic. He practiced uh, tantric yoga. And what you try to do is practice a form of yoga where you're loosing the serpent force, the kundalini force within your body and in your consciousness. And 
it, it's all quite crazy when you think about it. Even Reiki, you know, these doctors practice Reiki, and it's an occult form of laying on of the hands. And different Reiki literature talks about spiritual forces, transference of spirits, things of that nature through the practice of Reiki. So what in the world is Rick Warren, who's supposed to be a shepherd of his church, doing but opening the church up to all kinds of occult forces? And I've seen videotape of Rick Warren talking with these doctors about meditation. It's very simple. I mean, there's a meditation exercise from Harvard. Mm -hmm. It's not religious at all. It's yeah. called the relaxation response. Yeah, Take a big breath. Yeah. Right? Blow it out. Yeah. Every time you breathe out, say the word one. Yeah. Do it for 10 minutes. You got all these thoughts coming in your head. Imagine a big broom, so we'll weave them away. Yeah. And if you can just take some time mm -hmm. and pray or meditate, mm -hmm. it decreases stress. Your brain is better. Make better decisions. The emergent view of you know mysticism and experience and trying to experience God through mysticism is so tragic because what happens is uh, in mysticism, and this is, I mean, almost every ancient culture that has written somewhat extensively, you read in their writings about demonization. Uh, uh, anthropologists talk about the great majority of cultures recognize that demons are real. They're, they're real entities. And the Bible tells us to guard against them. But you have men like Dan Kimball, whose book I mentioned uh, Rick Warren had endorsed. He said the old paradigm is that if you have right teaching, then you will be able to experience God. But he says a new paradigm is that if you experience God, then you can have right teaching. And the problem with that is, before I was a Christian, I opened occult doors. Uh, before I was 18 and converted to Jesus Christ and found uh, Him as my Lord and Savior, uh, I was opening myself up to New Age philosophy and what have you. And I opened myself up to dark things. And if I would have followed Kimball's advice, I would think, wow, you know what? Now I need to follow the teachings these things are encouraging me in, you know? And I'd be lost. But thankfully, the Bible lets us know that we're to test experiences. Paul says, prove all things and hold fast or hold tight to that which is good in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. The Apostle John said, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether or not they are of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ is, has come in the flesh, he says, is the spirit of Antichrist. So it's very important that Christians realize there's mass deception going on out there and the emerging leaders, the emerging church leaders are actually opening their followers up to these demonic hosts, whether knowingly or unknowingly. You also have emergent leaders like Rob Bell leading their church, not only to guys like Ken Wilber who are teaching occultism and demonization and satanic views. Uh, you have Rob Bell also leading youth, leading many, many Christians into mystical practices, into different forms of mysticism and, and different forms of contemplative prayer, or different forms of Eastern meditation. For instance, he leads, you know, his, his audience and says, you know, put one hand on your belly, take a deep breath and breathe slowly, and then he simulates it. And he's leading them, you know, into Eastern mysticism. And then he tells them that the breath that's coming in and out is actually God. Take one hand, place it upon your belly. Take one hand, place it upon your chest. Let's breathe for a moment, shall we? Nice, big, deep breaths. Central to the Christian tradition for thousands of years have been disciplines of meditation, reflection, silence, and breathing. Now, from way back when, our ancestors understood that there's something divine about our breath. Take a moment as you breathe deeply to invite the God who made the universe into your breath. I wonder sometimes when we feel as though God is far. God is thinking, I gave you breathing. I can't get closer. Is God as close as breathing. Many of the emerging leaders, they'll have their followers, they'll encourage them to say words over and over and over again in their prayer life, contradicting what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus said not to be like the pagans who say the same things over and over again, thinking that they'll be heard of God, not to be repetitious, Jesus said, in your prayer life. And so it's incredibly heartbreaking that you have them taking a word or two words. They'll say, oh, well, you know, a lot of times it's the Bible, you know, it's a couple words from the Bible. But it's disassociated from its context. Meditating on the Bible is, what is God saying to me? What's your will, Father? How do I please you and glorify you? 
and you begin to pray and talk to him about his word, real biblical meditation will give me strength to obey you and, and obey your word. And it's a joyous encounter with God when you truly seek the Lord through his word. But when you take a word or two, you start repeating it because you feel like you're going to get some kind of spiritual effect. You're doing exactly what Jesus said not to do, and you're opening yourself up to these other forces. Warn these ones. I was going to talk to them, but Connie had such a tremendous testimony. I, uh, you don't know. You don't know. You don't know how hard it was to come up here last night. Ooh, to come up here last night when you're empty, when you're lost, when you're afraid, you're a little girl and you don't have control. Right? It was like, it was like I had a transplant. It was a transplant. God gave me a new heart and I could love that man down there that I hated when I came here because God used it. And now I want another dream. <laughs> I hope you caught that in the midst of all the emotion. She said I was, as a young girl, I was abused by a drunken alcoholic father. I came up here desperately seeking God to find that I'm in the midst of a bunch of drunken Christians. Let's welcome John Scotland. John, come and do what you do. Play your air guitar. But John and Carol had a barrel in the marketplace. Whoa! I want to read from, from Luke chapter 1. Some of you think that I don't give readings. Well, I was brought up in the Baptist church. Hey, isn't this pulpit good? I, you know, I, I, I've been going through different stages of drunkenness. And the stage I'm at at the moment is slouching. I've gone through the hiccup stage. I've gone through the phase of heckling the preachers. I got a kiss off George today. <laughs> I told him he needs to get a shave. <laughs> oh, okay, now, be, before we take off, you know, before we go surfing, let's get the reading done. <clears throat> Luke, Luke? <laughs> Chapter two. That's a good three. <laughs> we will get to the reading for those that like the reading. I shot the sheriff. I shot the deputy too. <laughs> Let's go back to the reading. Luke chapter 1. Verse, verse, verse. <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> <laughs> Luke 
chapter 1, verse... Now look at where John Scotland is today with this same anointing. Method in the madness. This is only crazy when, like Nicodemus, you don't understand the move of the spirit. I've done it. I'm not talking about give me a word, give me a word. I'll give you a word if you want a word. The word is get alive. in the craziness is to break the idolatry of the mind and to release the inner child. <laughs> generation that goes beyond our forefathers that doesn't despise what happened to our forefathers but we stand on their shoulders and we see higher, we see deeper, we see longer. I want to go beyond! but the drunkenness is to get you out of your old mindset. Hello? Out of your religiosity. When I first got drunk, oh, oh, just excuse me while I visit that meeting. <laughs> you can drink from meetings in the past. <laughs> You can drink from meetings in the future. <laughs> I'm already drinking from that meeting in February, bro. <laughs> hey! When I got drunk, when I first got drunk, my very first experience of getting drunk in the spirit, the only phrase I could say is, I know nothing. I know nothing. I know zilch. I know zed. I know zero. I know nothing anymore. I know nothing anymore. I don't know anything anymore. And God said, that's good. That's good. I don't want you moving under old influences. I want you to move in revelation of my spirit. I want you to go when I say go. I want you to stop when I say stop. I want you to speak when I tell you to speak. Stay yourselves and wonder. Cry ye out and cry. They are drunken, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord hath poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep, and hath closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers. The seers hath he covered. Workers. Workers. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus really thinks he finished the job. Let's just let him think he finished the job for a couple of days, okay? I like money. That's one of my favorite manifestations. You can say you don't like it, brother. What do you say? You're not supposed to like money. I'm not talking about the love of money, but I do love money. Amen? If you don't, you're lying. So I just started talking the ghost. Oh, 
Okay, now you, you, got, you have Jesus here in the Bible, jacked up on the Father. It says he, he got high up on the mountain every day. You know, he couldn't even do miracles until he got jacked up out of his mind on his Father. He says, it's not me that even does it. It's this new wine that does the miracles. It's the Father in me. Mm, Father, wonder what he is. Glory, light, electricity, called the Most High for a reason. Jesus, all of his miracles, signs, and wonders were because he was high on his Father. Listen, this is the most fun thing you can do on the face of the earth. Getting so jacked up on the Holy Spirit and then going around high with your friends and messing with demon-possessed people. <laughs> These guys were at the mall today messing with all kinds of demon-possessed people. And they liked it. They all want to get high. And I tell you what, you can only get them high, and this is a high where you never have to come down either. You can only get them high if they take that big hit from the rock. There's this older lady worshiping right in front of the platform. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. The gift of faith came on me. He said, kick her in the face with your biker boot. I inched closer and I went like this. Bam! And just as my boot made contact with her nose, she fell into the park. Now I was in another meeting one time and I called out this Chinese gentleman and all of a sudden I went running down the aisle and I, I hit this guy so hard it drove him back several feet. He hit the ground and his tooth popped right out of his mouth. Um, whew, getting, getting a hope from God. <laughs> To be able to see, to discern the times and the seasons that's ahead of you. And the thing about the elephant, it wasn't just an ordinary elephant, it was a wild elephant. A wild elephant. It was radical, 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 radical. Ooh, lift your hands and pray. Fire, fire, fire on little Joshi. Fire on my little boy. Fire. Fire on these kids! Get my wife up here! Bring the little girl here, bring her! Fire on little Lily! Lift your hands and bring the Holy Ghost! Fire on these girls! Come here, Jesse! Fire! 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 Fire on little Tasha! Fire! 
Come here, Kyle. Come back here, Kyle. Get his daddy up here. Mary, get your husband up here. It was a pretty normal communion service. It's just a big festival. It's a big feast. It's not supposed to be a, a morning, dirgeful, depressive, introspective, anal, retentive TSA scan. <laughs> and that's not my fault. <laughs> I thank God for his wine. I thank God for the cup of the New Testament. A big cup of wine. <laughs>God just loves the world and he is involved in in media TV in a major way music and he's prophesying through people that the world would call or Christians would call you know sat Satanist or whatever I hear songs on the radio that people are tapping into the spirit and they're prophesying stuff and they're and you could feel it and he says I will pour my spirit out on all flesh he didn't say I will pour my spirit out on Christians he said, all flesh. So I'm seeing it everywhere, and it's, you know, the, the mindsets have to change us, you know. If this great awakening of God is coming, and it, and it is coming, um, you know, the religious mindset's got to change, man. Jay Devil, my uh, wife's nickname is Devil. I've been fascinated with the devil my whole life, so it just kind of just slipped. It was totally organic and just happened. It's like with corn and everything else that I've done musically. It just represents indulgence and in, uh, doing what you want to do, uh, not ignoring your instincts. Do what you want to do, indulge all you want to do. I'm just going to do whatever I feel led to do. Awesome. How about you, dude? Anything at all? How's your back? This dude's going to heal people. Who needs healing? Your back's hurting, man. For Come me. on. Bethel Church in Redding, California manipulates audiences by piping in fog through the ventilation system, calling it glory clouds, an actual manifestation of the Holy Spirit. It's not. It's a fog machine. They do this with gold dust and feathers, too, saying they're actual angel feathers. Todd White goes up to some people on the street and says the Holy Spirit is telling him one of them has back problems. He does this gag with their feet, showing one leg is longer than the other. Then he prays to God and makes it look like God is growing out their leg to even it with the other one. He's literally pulling their leg. These men are lying, manipulative charlatans, but I repeat myself. Yet when you try to call them heretics, they have staunch defenders. No, they preach the gospel. They keep the main thing the main thing. Yeah, they really don't, but let's, for the sake of argument, say they did. All this with the glory clouds and street magic they call the Holy Spirit, do you really think God is okay with that? How is that not taking his name in vain? These men do not love the truth, they oppose it, corrupt magicians who are disqualified regarding the faith. Jesus said that we're to worship God in spirit and truth. The Bible says to share the truth in love. If it isn't true, it isn't loving. Paul said to the Corinthians, we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we'd commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. There's no question Bethel Church, Todd White, and others that do what they do are false teachers. We're to have nothing to do with them when we understand the text. Okay, I'll do it. You just relax.
Seriously? I'll, I'll, I'll lift it. Okay. Does it hurt if I lift them? Okay, let me do it then. Right. You just relax and I'll lift it. You start. You're still doing it. Okay. Yeah, this is quite a long way up. It's the whole length of your heel. Did you know that? No. Yeah, the right leg must be at least an inch shorter. Okay, super. Lord Jesus, let this right leg come down now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Let's exactly, exactly the same. Let all related pain go in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Exactly the same in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Okay. It's exactly the same. You feel that happening? Yeah. It goes exactly the same. So it feels. That's a long way. Gives you a lot of back pain. <laughs> okay, anybody else lower back? Second Thessalonians chapter 2 reading from verse 9. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie, and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. Worship. I saw a wave of worship hitting, hitting you. Yeah. I saw, I saw that there was no separation from worship in the church to the streets. Whoa! We just saw, I just saw it. Whoo! It's this like extravagant, uncontainable worship. It's like a fire. Yeah, mama, we bless you. Mama, we bless you. Whoa. Yeah, and I just... Ooh. You'll be known for worshiping, extravagant worship, laid down lovers. You couldn't, it's like it won't be stopped. It's like people will just fall on their knees and have no idea why. So we release, we release, other students who want to come in, we just release over the, over the camera right now. We just release the anointing of God um, that is in this place. And we pray that faith, faith, great faith would come on you. And we just release right now the anointing. Just take it now in Jesus' yeah. name. Take enduring faith. and yeah. Take a great faith to do miracles, yeah. to work miracles in the neighborhoods, in the supermarkets, but yeah. also an enduring faith to continue on and to not compromise your life, but to walk with the Lord yeah. Jesus. And he's releasing over you right now grace uh, yeah. for you to have enduring faith and to have a working of miracles as a lifestyle. Style. And so we just th thank you, Father, that what was on Smith Wigglesworth life, let it come on us, let it come yes. on them. In Jesus' mighty name, we bless you, love you guys so yeah, much. Yeah, and some someone who's watching has a mental illness, and God's healing you right now. <laughs> <laughs> come on. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Love you guys. <laughs> The Toronto Blessing Anointing was imparted here in 1994. And now?
Hi, I'm Andrew Strom, author of the new 2015 edition of Kundalini Warning, a false spirits invading the church. And the main reason we've put out this new version of the book is because of Bill Johnson and Bethel Church in Redding, California. Now there's no doubt that Bill Johnson is one of the most influential figures in the charismatic world today. But what really concerns us is what's going on behind the scenes at Bethel. Uh, this is what a bunch of drunk really Bethel awesome. students look like. <laughs> All of this footage comes from within Bethel itself. Obviously, as you can see, they're into spreading this drunkenness anointing, just like the others we've looked at. For years, Bill's wife, Benny Johnson, has been the senior co-pastor of Bethel alongside her husband. And this woman is into some truly weird new agey stuff, reflexology, and much more. Benny Johnson herself put out this picture. She's lying soaking on C.S. Lewis's grave. These are students from Bethel's School of Ministry and they've been photographed around the world lying on the graves of dead Christian leaders. There's a teaching in some of these circles that you can soak up the anointing by lying on their graves. Here's Bill Johnson himself at the grave of the wife of Smith Wigglesworth, the famous healing evangelist. Of course, people say that Bill Johnson is such a great teacher, such a great writer, but it's actually what's going on in the background that concerns us, the spreading of New Age practices, the spreading of a New Age type anointing, a foreign spirit. Those are the things that really worry us about Bethel. In 2012, the Bethel crowd put out this book, The Physics of Heaven, and the subtitle says it all. Exploring God's mysteries of sound, light, energy, vibrations, in quantum physics. Many Christian leaders, when they've read this book, say it is one of the most new age things they've ever seen. The contents are unbelievable. Just the chapter headings alone are proof enough. Vibrating in harmony with God. The God vibration. Dolphin therapy. Quantum mysticism. Human body frequencies. What on earth is a major ministry like Bethel doing, promoting such a weird and mystical work? Of course, this deeply New Age book is still sold on the Bethel website to this day. After all, that's who it's come from. There will be more on all this, a lot more, in our upcoming YouTube video, the fourth in the main series, Kundalini Warning. Amongst other things, we'll be looking at how Bethel has spread its influence to millions and millions of young Christians around the world. My own eyes. So look out for shocking documentary number four, Kundalini Warning, coming soon on YouTube. I'm Andrew Strom, author of the book Kundalini Warning, Are False Spirits Invading the Church? Now, of course, that's a very radical title, and uh, we're going to be looking at a, a huge amount of video footage in this documentary, and I want to show you some of the shocking things and, and just how similar they are to the Kundalini cults of Hinduism and the New Age movement, Eastern religions. Um, the stuff that's been invading in the last, say, 16 to 17 years, I believe it's the worst invasion in church history. So we've got a lot to look at. And my background is I've been involved in the charismatic movement myself for over 25 years. I've been part of the prophetic movement. I was part of that movement for 11 years. So I saw all of this incredibly alarming and disturbing stuff coming in 
uh, while I was involved. I first heard about this man, Rodney Howard Brown, in about 1993-94. He was holding huge meetings in the United States, very popular, and was starting to have a huge influence with his drunkenness. He called himself the Holy Ghost bartender, and he would lay hands on people, imparting to them this laughter, or he would wave his hands at people, and this laughter would overcome them, or shaking, or uncontrollable jerking. Uh, all these manifestations were starting to happen. And uh, he became huge in the word of faith because he's a huge prosperity preacher. So he uh, got himself on Kenneth Copeland's uh, television program and you can see them behaving drunkenly on stage, live on television. Here's Rodney Howard Brown imparting uh, the spirit of drunkenness and laughter into uh, some of the biggest leaders in Tulsa, Oklahoma, the biggest word of faith, prosperity teachers. A guy called Randy Clark came down, saw what was happening, got this impartation through the laying on of hands, got this anointing himself, and he took it into the vineyard movement. Now here is Todd Bentley explaining uh, how Randy Clark brought this in. He received a spark of the anointing in Tulsa and in Lakeland came down. And just weeks later, God used him as the fire starter for the Toronto outpouring and the Toronto blessing in January 1994. And we have here tonight Randy Clark. And I asked him to come out, dear Randy, because I know you're a fire starter and you've been lighting fires all over the world. So it entered into the Toronto Airport Vineyard Church. And so it became known as the Toronto Blessing. Went worldwide under that name, the Toronto Blessing. Everybody knew what that was about. People falling down, acting drunken, laughing hysterically, shaking uncontrollably, or uh, jerking backwards and forwards, their, their head shaking back and forth. People even roaring like lions. People making animal noises. Um, you know, this stuff had not been seen in the church. I mean, it may be in a tiny way on the fringes. This stuff had never been seen in the church on this scale before, and it invaded worldwide. So all around the world, especially in the Commonwealth countries, we're talking England and all through the UK, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Canada, and many other nations all over the world, all through Europe, all of the charismatic movement was into this stuff uh, for the large part. And so this thing became a worldwide sensation just in a couple of years. Now the basic question that we're asking in this documentary is why are these manifestations so similar to Eastern religions and Hinduism and the Kundalini cults and yet they're not found in scripture, they're not found in the Bible, they're not found in classical Christianity at all. <laughs> Of course, in Hinduism, one of the most common ways of experiencing a kundalini awakening is through a guru placing his hand upon your forehead. This is called Shaktipat. And when they do that, you'll be infused with this incredible love and this wave of emotion. You'll fall down. There'll be all these manifestations, maybe animal noises, uh, joy and weeping and shaking. This is a kundalini awakening. And amazingly, it is exactly the same as what we have been seeing in the Toronto Blessing. Now this all began with Rodney Howard Brown imparting a new anointing into a bunch of leaders and they spread it around the world. In fact, it spread like wildfire. How do we know that Rodney Howard Brown had a pure anointing? How do we know it wasn't a kundalini spirit from the beginning? Because it seems absolutely identical to it. 
Now one of the very clearest signs of a Kundalini awakening has always been these Kriyas. You see this woman involved in the New Age movement, she's walking along exhibiting these Kriyas happening, involuntary uh, jerking motions. And the staggering thing about it is that we are seeing again and again and again these exact same type of Kriyas right through the Toronto movement. This has always been one of the clearest signs of Kundalini that we know of. A friend of mine from South Africa who's done a tremendous amount of research on this topic says that Kundalini is like a false Holy Spirit. It produces even miracles and healings and fusions of love and power and energy and emotion and uh, all these kinds of things and yet it's the Hindu version of the Holy Spirit and it's not holy. Now we all know that in the last days the Bible speaks again and again warning of deception, seducing spirits. It says that it'll be perilous times will come. It says there'll be lying signs and wonders. It says all of these things, soberness, sobriety, uh, being alert, being watchful. This is what it says to us all the way through the prophecies of the last days. Here we are. We're in the end times now. And what do we have on our hands? We have a movement that's promoting weird and bizarre signs and wonders. We have a movement promoting drunkenness when we're told to be sober in the last days again and again. It's promoting all kinds of whacked out spiritual experiences. And we are warned in the last days, watch out for seducing spirits. The Bible even says, it goes as far as saying this, if possible, the very elect themselves would be deceived. So I don't want to be taking any chances with deceiving spirits in the last days. If it's weird, if it looks like Hinduism, if it looks like it's from some Eastern religion, I don't want any part of it. The charismatic movement should have shut it out and said, no, we're not having this. This is exactly what is warned about in Scripture. Welcome to the second part of this documentary. I'm Andrew Strom, author of the book Kundalini Warning, Are False Spirits Invading the Church? As we've already seen in the 1990s, this bizarre new movement with drunkenness and animal noises falling down, jerking and all of this spread around the world. We think Toronto's something. Wait till they come to Boston. And of course, Charisma Magazine, one of the most popular Christian magazines, was right behind it. In the USA, another revival took off in Brownsville, Pensacola, which at least had real repentance preaching, but it also had a lot of this truly bizarre stuff as well. Aches and he grieves for your spirit. He grieves for you. <laughs> And then in 2008 came the biggest one of all, Todd Bentley and the Lakeland Revival. This outpouring kicked off when Todd Bentley, a 32-year-old Canadian with a long-time healing ministry, came to do just five nights of meetings in one Lakeland church. Bam! We're in 214 nations a night, potential audience 400 million. And, and 10 hours a day, we're, we're literally around the world. People are seeing what's happening here in Florida. That's because God TV made the unprecedented and extremely expensive decision to preempt all their primetime programming and broadcast the Lakeland meetings every night. Now there's no question that this was one of the biggest, most publicized movements that the Christian world has ever seen. We had 550,000 different computers have logged into the webcast. That's incredible. But of course, the Lakeland movement was also loaded with the same bizarre manifestations as we've seen elsewhere. A little bit of that glory's coming on me. And we're, we have an international television audience tonight. And 
I got that vibrating again. Lord, let everybody vibrate. So what were some of Todd Bentley's biggest influences? Well, he tells us himself. But one outpouring that's most precious to me, because it brought intimacy and in the presence of God to the church. It brought refreshing and renewal to the church was what took place in Toronto, Canada. So it's no surprise that Todd Bentley invited the founder of the Toronto Blessing, Randy Clark, to minister at this new revival. I see some of you already the power of God. It's like 110. God, make it 220. Now thousands and thousands of leaders and Christians were coming to Lakeland from all over the world to get an impartation of the Spirit. And our focus here in Florida every night is I lay hands on every single person that comes, whether it's 5,000, 10,000, and I'm praying, God, give it away, give it away, give it away. That's the focus here, impartation. Some are saying this is the most contagious anointing the world has ever seen. Just look at what people are receiving here and taking back to their own city and their own church. Here's what happened in Dudley, England, when the Lakeland anointing arrived there. And this was repeated all around the world in hundreds and hundreds of churches wherever this anointing went. Even Charisma magazine began to question some of what was going on. But that didn't stop the very biggest leaders in the charismatic movement from endorsing and promoting this movement. On June 23, 2008, they held a special commissioning ceremony for Todd Bentley live at Lakeland with the very biggest apostles and prophets of the charismatic movement. This is Peter Wagner, the head apostle of the entire charismatic movement worldwide. And here's Rick Joyner, the top prophet of the movement. This commissioning represents a powerful spiritual transaction taking place in the invisible world. With this in mind, I take the apostolic authority that God has given me and I decree to Todd Bentley, your power will increase, your authority will increase, your favor will increase, your influence will increase, your revelation will increase. Of course, only weeks later, Todd Bentley's movement completely fell apart and no amount of Stacey Campbell shaking her head was going to change that fact. And receiving the tablets came after Numbers 24. Just a few weeks later, on July the 9th, ABC Nightline had a special on Todd Bentley and the Lakeland Revival. Little did we know this would be the beginning of the end of the revival. Can you supply us with three people who have been cured through miracle with their medical diagnosis, their names. But we never got three. Instead, we were given a binder filled with what Bentley says are stories of inspiring miracles. It offered incomplete contact information, a few pages of incomplete medical records, doctors' names were crossed out. And so, not a single miracle claim of Bentley's could be verified. But then came even more shocking news. Todd Bentley was separating from his wife. He'd apparently been having an affair with a female staff member even while the revival was going. And of course, at this point, the entire revival collapsed. Lee Grady, the editor of Charisma magazine, spoke for multitudes around the world when he wrote these words. Todd Bentley's announcement that his marriage is ending has thrown our movement into a tailspin and questions need to be answered. It was not supposed to end like this. But sadly, that was not the end. Todd Bentley divorced his wife, married his girlfriend, and the biggest prophetic ministry in the world, run by Rick Joyner, undertook a speedy restoration process to fast track Todd Bentley back on stage again. That's and now here he is, back again, ministering alongside his new wife. 
And the thing about the elephant, it wasn't just an ordinary elephant, it was a wild elephant, a wild elephant. As we've already seen, these same spasmodic head movements in Hinduism are taken as a sure sign of a Kundalini awakening. Why then are we now seeing them in the church? It is for everyone, for every Christian. For and so, aided and abetted by some of the biggest names in Christendom, Todd Bentley and others continue to spread this anointing right through the charismatic church. Jesus, I pray some of you would feel like you're getting electrocuted. But this is not just about Todd Bentley and his friends. This is about thousands of charismatic leaders all over the world who made the decision not just to bring this stuff in and endorse it, but to actually transfer it onto their own people. And I don't care if, if it was peer pressure, uh, just because every other minister seemed to be getting into it. I don't care what the reasons were. This is one of the worst, most disturbing movements that maybe the church has ever seen. And these guys brought it in deliberately into the church. And when the very top apostles and prophets in the entire charismatic movement can get up on a stage and endorse and promote and prophesy the grandest things over such a suspect movement that was obviously suspect right from the start, we've got to know our top leadership, they don't have any discernment. Your power will increase. Your authority will increase. Your favor will increase. We need a revolution in the leadership of the church. Welcome to part three of this documentary. I'm Andrew Strom, author of the book Kundalini Warning, Are False Spirits Invading the Church? As I was saying earlier, I'm a charismatic, Pentecostal, tongue-speaking believer myself. So I'm not against any of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I want to see uh, more and more people filled with the Spirit of God, full of the love and the holiness of God. But as we've seen, a new generation of leaders has arisen, and it doesn't seem like holiness that they're spreading. I want to read from... from Luke chapter 1. This is John Crowder, probably the worst that I've ever seen. And yet his influence is growing enormously, especially amongst the youth. Lord, I love your heavy, drunken glory. I firmly believe in token the ghost, right? <laughs> I have a little Jehovah Wana. And so we just, all I have to, and the thing is, it's free. You just reach in your pocket. Wow, look at what's there. You just take a little. <laughs> Hello, hello, with the glory. A basic question here. At <laughs> what point does something go from being right only tantamount right? to blasphemy and become real, actual blasphemy? Point right here. This is the stuff that John Crowder and his friends have been spreading all over the earth. Welcome to Slosh Fest, which they hold every year, attracting hundreds and hundreds of people. And of course, if anybody questions what they're doing, they're immediately accused of being a religious Pharisee. So apparently we're not even allowed to use our discernment, even though the Bible commands us to do so. Here's the well-known author and speaker, Jim Goal, taking part in the drunken glory with Crowder and his accomplice, Ben Dunn. And here's Ben Dunn ministering this drunkenness anointing to the young people at Bill Johnson's famous Bethel Church in Redding, California. In fact, a lot of this movement now is targeting young people. Now, Bill Johnson is a very famous charismatic leader, author of the book, When Heaven Invades Earth. But what people don't realize is that Bill's church in Redding is one of the major centers for this drunkenness anointing in North America. They specialize in what they call the fire tunnel where they impart this anointing to all the young people. Can you imagine walking into a room that sounds like this? We worship you. We worship you. And of course, Bill Johnson and Cheyenne and John and Carol Arnott from Toronto openly endorsed and promoted Todd Bentley and the Lakeland Revival. And we stand with you. 
Another major center where they're imparting this drunkenness anointing to the young people is IHOP, the International House of Prayer in Kansas City. We've already drunk in the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Here's the IHOP founder, Mike Bickle, welcoming Bill Johnson and the main Toronto Blessing leaders to partner with IHOP. The three rivers, Kansas City, Reading and Toronto, must come together. Wow! Who said it again? Wow! Say it again! Say it again! Now, this drunkenness thing, where did that come from? Why are they behaving drunk and saying, oh, this is the Holy Spirit? They say, oh, it's just like the book of Acts in Acts chapter 2. And I say, no, it's not like the book of Acts in Acts chapter 2. It doesn't say they were reeling around. It says that they were speaking in other tongues and other people heard it and they said, oh, maybe these people are drunk. It wasn't because they're reeling around and behaving literally like drunk people. In fact, the Bible warns us again and again in the last days, be sober, be vigilant, don't be drunk. So why is the charismatic movement giving itself over to manifestations that seem the opposite of sobriety and the opposite of holiness? In fact, they look more like outright paganism. This is Rick Joyner's Morningstar Church, and of course, this is the other major center of this anointing in North America. Can anybody please tell me the difference between this and outright paganism? As we can see, a lot of this stuff has a real New Age feel to it. In fact, when you go to John Crowder's website, he openly advertises his mystical schools, where people can learn to operate in trances, raptures, ecstatic prayer, mysticism, spirit travel, and every other New Age sounding thing you can imagine. And yet Christian leaders all over the world are promoting these ministries. People are being deceived into believing in guided visualization, astral travel, centering prayer, stigmata, and all kinds of New Age practices. Of course, they call them different names, like contemplative prayer and spirit travel, to hide the fact of how totally New Age they are. This is Lucy Rail, who now has a home in the charismatic movement simply because of these bizarre signs and wonders. And this is Joshua Mills, who specializes in glittering dust appearing, as well as out of body spirit travel and other things. All over my body, people will travel hundreds of miles to see this stuff. And then there are the angels. Even though the Bible specifically warns us about angels of light, now everywhere we look we see the weirdest and most bizarre accounts of so-called angels appearing. But why do they not carry the holy fear of the Lord like the angels in the Bible? This is Sid Roth's TV show, which apart from God TV is one of the biggest promoters of all these strange experiences in the church. My guest, Joshua Mills, is a legitimate sign and wonder. And this is Patricia King of Extreme Prophetic, interviewing the famous prophet Bob Jones as well as Todd Bentley. You gave me a phone call and you said, hey, I've just been soaking with Bob Jones and I've gone up into the third heaven and all that. And, and it was all new to me. I'd never even heard that kind of language before and I was so hungry for yeah. it. I hope you can see that all these different ministries and streams are really one big movement, united by this strange anointing that they started spreading everywhere in the 1990s and still they spread it today. And so we're left with an enormous worldwide movement in the church that is absolutely loaded with spiritual forces and practices and experiences that seem to come straight out of Eastern mysticism. 
And they're busy telling us not to discern, but to turn off our mind. Not only that, but it seems very clear that it's targeting the youth. Is this movement dangerous? Clearly we have to say yes, and hopefully through this documentary you can see why. But there's just one thing I want to talk about before we bring this program to a close. You know, a lot of people when they see this stuff, they go right over to the other extreme. They don't want any miracles. They don't want any prophecies whatsoever. They want nothing to do with a supernatural God. But we see from the New Testament again and again, God does do miracles. They are holy miracles. God does do supernatural things, but they have a holy character about them. Even angels do visit people from time to time. They are holy angels. And this is the distinction we've got to make. And we can't afford to be losing the New Testament. We can't afford to be doing away with healings and miracles. We've got to have these things. We've got to have them in balance. We should have them in abundance. We've got to be a New Testament people. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. The gift of faith came on me. He said, kick her in the face with your biker boot. I inched closer and I went like this. Bam! And just as my boot made contact with her nose, she fell into the power of God. And I saw him and the gift of faith came on me. I said, what do I do, God? And God told me to just run him down. So I jumped up in the air and I went, BAM! And I hit him to the ground, jumped onto him, and got into a full mount. Ground and pound. I jumped on there and I was in a full mount. And something came over me. And instead of punching him, I grabbed him by the neck and started choking him. And I said, come out of him, devil! Come out of him, devil! And I was in another meeting one time and I called out this Chinese gentleman. And all of a sudden, I went running down the aisle, and I, I hit this guy so hard, it drove him back several feet. He hit the ground, and his tooth popped right out of his mouth. The pastor was lying on the floor, and I was standing up on the platform, and I said, God, I want revival. And he said these words to me, leg drop the pastor. Jesus. 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 At the same time all this is happening, uh, others from the outside looking in, uh, sometimes we're, we're quite critical because of, of some of the manifestations that were happening, you know, the laughing or shaking or, mm -hmm. or falling down and all these uh, unusual things. Um, how did you handle that criticism? We... Um we tried to be, you know, um, we tried to listen when criticism was valid. With signs and wonders, Lord, let miracles increase, let power increase, let the glory of God be shouted among the nations because the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the water covers the sea. And I just, Take it here. And I just saw the Lord sprinkling salt. Whoa! In those wells. Purifying, cleansing. Whoa! Lord, any defilement that's on those wells, Lord, is coming off right now. In the mighty name of Jesus, Lord. Whoa! You're purifying. The next wave is a pure stream of your presence, Lord. A pure stream of your love. A pure stream of your power, Lord. God, I thank you for pouring salt. Yo, in each well. In Jesus' name. Wow. Yo. But there are people who, who just didn't want any kind of uh, thing that they could not control. And I, I figured out control was really at the, at the issue for people. Right. 
yeah. and it scared people. And it, it was scary, yeah. no question. But we just sort of loved them and said, hey, if you don't like it, don't come. We believe this is God and we're going for it. John chapter 9 from verse 39. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin, but now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. The Letter of Jude Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ, and called. Mercy unto you, and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you, and exhort you, that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> Luke chapter one, verse. 